Hi everyone, I'm excited to give you a message this week on the importance of us as individuals and as a church living a lifestyle of prayer. Uh, our second commitment within our kingdom calling is to be a people who live a, in constant communion with God through a lifestyle of worship, prayer and fasting. We talked about worship last time, today we're going to talk about prayer, next time we'll look at fasting. Two things I really want to hit on this week uh, for you to ponder and to take in. Uh, firstly, what does it look like to live a lifestyle of prayer? Not just having prayer as something we do now and again as Christians or prayer meetings as something we go to. But what does it look like for a life to be encompassed, uh, saturated, consumed in prayer? Uh, what does it look like for us to treat prayer uh, talking to God the same way we treat breathing is like something we have to do the same way we treat eating like something that's needed to sustain us so I want to talk to you about that today I also want to talk to you about how the Lord has taught us to pray uh, so what does it look like for a life to be kind of saturated in prayer and uh, what does it look like to pray properly to pray correctly uh, there's there's right ways and wrong ways to pray Jesus taught that so we'll touch on that as well uh, so when we think about a life that is really encompassed in prayer of course the best person to go to is Jesus Christ um, as we go back into the Old Testament uh, into the Psalms which I love reading the Psalms and you see so many prophetic references in the Psalms pointing forward to the days that Jesus would come and pointing forward to God's plan for the earth. We see in Psalm 2 that uh, there's a conversation going on between the Father, God the Father, and the Son of God. And it says this, it says, the Lord said to me, so this is the Father speaking to the Son, you are my Son, today I have begotten you, ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. We see in that kind of fly on the wall moment where we get a glimpse of a conversation between the father and the son. We see how the father has planned redemption to come to the world through his relationship with the son. Where he says, son, ask of me and I'll make the nations your heritage. He's saying, ask of me and you will own the nations. You will possess the nations. Uh, ask of me and you will redeem the nations. Ask of me and all of the enemies of mankind will be put under your feet, the father is saying. Now, the father could, again, have just made that happen. And we often say this with prayer. There's, there's lots of things the father could just do without us. I often tell the story of when I was once on a a radio show and I used to do street work on, on BBC radio and uh, the presenter said to me um, you know why does God need you why does he need you to pray why does he need you to do his work if he has a will why can't he just accomplish it and I don't know the full answer to that but what I do know is that it's far more glorious for God to choose to use individuals to accomplish his will for him to work in the life of an individual to strengthen them to cause them to desire what he desires, to cause them to pray and to cause them to work for his will to come to pass. That it is if he just does it in an authoritarian way. So in his sovereignty, that's the way God has designed the world. And, and ultimately it's for his glory. And that's why he's chosen to send his son. That's why he's chosen to cause his son to pray. That's why he's placed an invitation to his son saying to his son, ask of me and I'll make the nations your heritage. So the father invites Jesus into this eternal um, role as an intercessor. And, and that's what Jesus is doing now, of course. He's at the right hand of the father in heaven. And the Bible says he ever lives to make intercession. He is asking the father. He's saying, father, bring all of those into your kingdom uh, that you desire. Father, protect the church. Father, strengthen the church father make the church blameless uh, father give me the nations and so jesus lives even now in his ascended form at the right hand of the father he lives a lifestyle of prayer so we see this this has to be the starting point we see in god's redemption plan for the world he plans that jesus will be an intercessor that will be jesus's main role 
in between his ascension and his second coming. And so as we're called to live a lifestyle of worship and prayer, we look at Jesus because Jesus was altogether righteous and without sin. Uh, we, we look at his lifestyle because he was the suffering servant who was faithful and obedient to the Father. But we want to follow his example because he is the chief intercessor. He is the chief prayer, if you like. So that's why we look to him, for example. So we, we use that as a starting point. Um, but let's just go back to Jesus' life and think about his life on the earth. We see that um, Jesus' strategic decision-making uh, came from a place of prayer. He had some strategic decisions to make about his ministry, who he would have in his ministry, where he would send them, when he would send them, um, how he would send them. Let's just think about Luke chapter 6, verses 12 to 13. It says this, that in these days, he, meaning Jesus, went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. And when the day came, he called his disciples and chose from them 12 who he named apostles. What an important decision that was, who Jesus would choose to be his apostles. Uh, apostle means sent one, the ones who would go and see the early church established, who would lay a foundation on which the last 2,000 and odd years of history have been built. That was an important decision to make. Now, Jesus, being in the form of God, being the son of God, you might think, well, surely he knew uh, who he should chose. But we see a reliance there. He goes up the mountain and he's not there for 10 minutes or 20 minutes. He's there all night and he's praying to his father. And I have a theory because Jesus told us to not use lots of words when we pray that most of that time up the mountain, he was listening to his father. And that's really where we start in the place of prayer. We ponder on who God is and we listen to God. And so there he is. And uh, it's not just him petitioning the Lord, saying, give me wisdom, give me wisdom, give me wisdom all night. It's him communing with the Lord. It's his heart being united to his father's heart in the place of prayer. So we see that in decisions he had to make about his life, he sought the Lord. And again, with all of these things I'm going to place before you, consider this. Uh, do you do that with strategic decisions you have to make? Do you seek the Lord? Do you tarry with the Lord um, and, and wait with him and listen to him and ponder on what his heart would be? Uh, the next thing is he relied on prayer to keep his disciples in the faith. So he preached to his disciples. He taught his disciples, but he knew without the working of the father, he couldn't keep them in the faith. This is what he said in Luke 22. Uh, 31 to 32 he said to Peter who was previously known as Simon he said Simon Simon behold Satan has demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat but I have prayed for you that your faith might not fail and when you've turned again strengthen your brothers isn't that amazing that Jesus knew Satan's plan was to sift Peter. His plan was to test Peter. And we know in Peter's life, he faced great testing. And he fell at times. Jesus knew that he would fall. He predicted it. But he said, I've, I've prayed for you. You're going to fall, but I, I've prayed for you that the, the faith in your heart will not go out. That burning ember that might be left, it's not going to be snuffed out. I've, I've prayed it's going to be fanned into flame. And so in love, he prayed, in love for his disciples, in his heart, for them to go on and continue on till the end, that they might be saved in the last day. He prayed for them. That was a key part of his ministry. Not just praying that they would make a decision for him, but praying that they would remain in the faith. Uh, we see Jesus relied on prayer to walk in obedience to his God-given calling in his life. Luke 22, 40 to 42, Jesus is about to go to the cross for the redemption of the world. And it says, when he came to the place, and that was to the Garden of Gethsemane, he said to his disciples, pray that you might not enter into temptation. So he, he instructs them to pray. He says, you, you, know, you need to pray that God would help you not fall. And we all need to do that. Uh, again, we can't live a righteous life. We can't avoid temptation and overcome temptation without praying for help. 
so Jesus instructed them to pray and then it says then he withdrew from about a stone's throw and he knelt down and he prayed saying father if you're willing remove this cup from me nevertheless not my will but yours be done Jesus is facing a horrendous death uh, the, the, the mocking the uh, the taunting the crown of thorns the, the nails through his wrists through his feet um, just imagine how excruciating that was physically but but even more so the fact that our sin would be laid upon him was probably the most excruciating thing for Jesus in his flesh he did he didn't want to go to the cross he wasn't looking forward to going to the cross um, but he had overcome his flesh how does he do that he goes and kneels down and he prays father not my will but your will be done he's he's not just making a declaration there he's he's praying for a strengthening uh, in himself that he might be obedient because obedience to the father is hard and it, it it calls for the the laying down of one's life literally in the case of christ and then as we go on and we think about jesus ministry to people we see that whole ministry was shrouded in prayer uh, we see Jesus waking up early in the mornings, uh, you know, and, and so he was seeking power from heaven to, to preach the gospel, to keep preaching the gospel and to deal with evil spirits. Uh, Mark chapter 1, in various verses from verse 35 onwards, it says that rising very early in the morning, not just early, but he got up very early in the morning, while it was still dark, which is not easy, we all know, he departed. And he went out to a desolate place and there he prayed and it says after he met his disciples he said to them let us go to the next towns that i'm that i may preach there also for that is why i came out and he went through all galilee preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons he had a full day ahead of him it wasn't going to be an easy day preaching the gospel is not easy you're, you're faced with lots of opposition um, we've been out in the past couple of weeks and we've faced great demonic opposition when we've been out preaching the gospel jesus made a point of getting up early in the morning to pray now did jesus know the gospel of course he knew the gospel he is the gospel uh, did did jesus have human wisdom that he could use uh, in order to convince people to obey the truth yes he did why didn't he just use that because he recognized it through his life he needed to rely on the power from his father to be effective, uh, to be, uh, to do ministry in a way that's sustainable. And so he made a sacrifice. His life was a sacrifice, not just his death, but his life. He got up very early in the morning and he prayed and he went to a desolate place. He wasn't around any distractions. He went to a quiet place of solitude and he prayed. And of course, it goes without saying that that's a good habit to be in. And uh, we're getting up is a church early in the mornings and we're praying together uh, we're doing it on zoom so you can do it in your home we're getting up at a uh, quarter to eight and that's early it's not very early but it's early and we're praying together you can do that you can come and join us you can uh, make that sacrifice know that if you do god will empower you and strengthen you for the day and if you don't want to do that you can pray on your own um, but it's a good habit to be in so he prayed before he did any ministry and he prayed during the time he was doing ministry we see him speaking to his father in prayer during his ministry we see that his ministry in and of itself he saw that as a partnership between him and his father at john chapter 11 40 to 44 jesus said to a woman he said i did not tell you that if you believed you would see the did i not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of god and it says so they took away the stone and jesus lifted up his eyes and said father i thank you that you've heard me i know that you always hear me but i said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me and when he had said these things he cried out with a loud voice lazarus come out the man who had died came out of course that's about the story of lazarus with his sisters mary and martha around the place where jesus rose lazarus from the dead he spoke to his father uh, that people would see that he and his father were one he did it as an example and so during the raising of La the raising of lazarus he's in this constant communion with his father which again we need to be doing 
as we're going out and doing ministry and we're ministering to people. We need to be having this um, ho- uh, vertical relationship with God as we have this horizontal relationship with people. It's a, it's a two-way conversation between us and God and then a two-way conversation between us and people all of the time. Uh, and then we see him praying after he did ministry. We see him winding down by praying, going and seeking time alone with the Father again. Uh, Matthew fourteen twenty two to 23, after the feeding of the 5,000, it says immediately after that, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go out before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. He's by himself before he does ministry, praying to the Father. He's dialoguing with the Father while he's doing ministry. And then after he's done ministry, he goes away and he prays again to his Father. He seeks a refreshing from his Father. He seeks a replenishing in the Spirit from his Father because ministry takes it out of you. So hopefully I've laid it out for you there, a very brief Bible survey, a very brief snapshot of Jesus' whole life being encompassed in prayer and if we are in Christ who is this chief intercessor how much more does our life need to be encompassed in prayer like that Uh, what are the things that keep us from living a life of prayer like Jesus well I think there are many symptoms that we maybe think keep us from prayer but they are not really the root of the problem when I talk about symptoms things like having the tv on uh, things like our phones, being glued to our phones all the time, Uh, things like being glued to our tablets, the things that cause us to procrastinate. Uh, Sometimes we we think there's not enough time in the day to pray and it's because we're too busy at work. And all of these things we can look at as reasons and we can try um, cutting things out and and, and rejigging our diary around uh, in order to make ourselves pray. But none of that is any good unless we get to the root of the reason why we don't pray as we should and I think and I'm convinced the root of the reason is the issue of pride and another way I would put this is it's the issue of self-sufficiency because essentially a lifestyle of prayer is saying and is shouting I need you God I need you Father I can't do this on my own I can't do it without you And the call to live a lifestyle of prayer is really the call to childlike reliance. We have to become like children to enter into the kingdom of God and to remain in the kingdom of God. And and we know being childlike, not childish, but childlike is reliance on our father. It's, it's, It's that recognition that we can't do anything without him. I heard a story recently which I, I found really powerful and I'm going to tell you this, it's it's a second-hand story so it's not come from somebody I know but I heard it but I think it'll it'll speak to you um, and so the story was of a chaplain who worked in a hospital and he used to go around and do his duties on the wards and as you'd imagine as a chaplain some people welcomed him and, and others didn't and they, there used to be a man that you'd go past every day who was lying in his bed and as the chaplain went past, he used to just stick his fingers, I won't do it, but he used to just stick his fingers up at the chaplain. Like, Every day the chaplain went past. And so, you know, the chaplain just kind of looked and smiled and, and, and didn't really retaliate, didn't respond. Um, but this one day, the chaplain was going past and he was expecting to get the two fingers. And he didn't get that. And the man said, hey, excuse me, can, can I have a word with you? The chaplain was surprised, but he said, yeah, sure. So he went over and he sat down next to this man, next to his bed in the chair. And the guy said, "Um, what's all this about then? Why, like why you wear that collar and, 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 and and what you believe in your faith. And I want to know about it. Tell me about it. So the chaplain started sharing the kind of the core aspects of the Christian faith and what Christians believe. And he said, ultimately it's about a relationship with God. And he got into talking to this guy about prayer and, um, he said, the guy said, well, how do, how do I pray? How, like, how do I do that? And, and the man said, well, it's just a conversation. Tell God how you're feeling, how you're feeling. And the guy said, you know, I'm scared. I'm, I'm worried. He said, well, tell God those things. And the guy was still struggling a little bit to grasp it. And so the chaplain 
uh, stood up and he, he put the chair next to the guy next to the bed and he said, pretend Jesus is sitting in that chair. Just talk to him. Just speak to him. And he's there and he'll listen and he'll talk back to you and listen to what he's got to say. And um, the guy said, you know, thank you. Thank, th thank you for sharing that with me. And um, the chaplain went off. And then a couple of days later, the chaplain came back in and the man wasn't in the bed anymore. And uh, he spoke to the nurses on the reception and the nurses said, oh, I'm afraid that man's passed away. And uh, the chaplain said, oh, you know, I'm really sorry to hear that. And, and the nurse said, but there's something we need to tell you. After he met with you, he was full of life and he was bounding with joy. And he kept telling us about this Jesus that you told him about. And the chaplain said, oh, wow, that, you know, that's really encouraging. That, you know, that's good. Thanks for sharing that. And then the, the matron said, actually, there is one thing that we want you to know. And you might find this a little bit strange. They said, um, when, we, when we found him and we, he died, um, he was sitting on the side of his bed with the hips on the side of the bed. And he was leaning over the chair and his arms were wrapped around the chair. And uh, the chaplain started to weep. And he started to weep because he realised that the man had got it. The man who had asked about Christianity and had been given this explanation and had only known it for maybe half a day, he totally got it. And the point is that it's all about reliance on God. And that's what prayer is about. It's about leaning over and putting our weight upon God, putting our weight upon Jesus and letting him carry our load. It's, it's that childlike reliance on him. And, and that man passed away and probably we think passed into glory in that position, leaning upon God. And essentially that's what prayer is all about. So that's really the core basis of how we get to the place of living a life of prayer like Jesus it's it's that life of reliance and if that reliance isn't there we can jiggle our diaries around we can remove our tablets our phones and everything else as much as we want but it won't make a great deal of difference it, it has to be um, that 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 core uh, understanding within us that without him we can do nothing it has to be that childlike reliance I want to talk to you now uh, about some aspects of how we should pray from the Lord's Prayer. The disciples didn't ask Jesus to teach them anything apart from how to pray. They didn't say, Jesus, teach us how to worship. They didn't say, Jesus, teach us how to preach the gospel. They didn't say, Jesus, teach us how to do pastoral care or teach us, teach us a church growth strategy. But they did say, Jesus, teach us how to pray. And that tells us that there's a right way and a wrong way. And uh, Jesus said, D don't pray like the pagans, pray with vain repetition. Uh, lots of words, empty words, but pray like this. And then he went on in Matthew 6 and he taught them the Lord's Prayer. And I, I fully believe that the Lord's Prayer isn't just something to be repeated. It can be, um, but more than that, it's a pattern to teach us ways in which we should pray. And uh, I'm going to go through this and just explain what I mean to you. Uh, so the first line in the Lord's Prayer from Matthew 6, 9 is, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Now, I've come to this understanding that the, the first port of call in the place of prayer is beholding who God is, declaring God's attributes and declaring God's worth. And uh, before you speak to someone, you should think about who you're speaking to. And we do that in human life. We address people differently depending on who they are. We would address a friend differently to a member of the royal family if we were going on a, a visit to the palace. And uh, we have to remember who God is. And we come to him with, in awe. And we come to him in reverence. And we consider who we're speaking to. And, you know, when you stand in awe of God, actually, there aren't many words. You don't just talk to him like he's your busy mate. You know, you, you, you behold him and you, you, you're, you're in that place of standing before holy God, who you know welcomes you and who loves you and uh, who you can approach with confidence. Um, but a God who's almighty and all-powerful. And that's why Jesus said, hallowed be your name. Okay, because we remember that we're talking to a, a holy God. 
The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 3.2, Be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. So again, we understand as we behold God, we don't go with loads of words. We don't just go with a list of things we want to give to God. We ponder on who he is and we listen. And we think, as we think about who he is, we think how that should affect what we're about to say and what we're about to ask and what he would want us to ask of him. That's the first thing. The second thing is that as we pray, we're to ask God what he to accomplish what he's already promised us he's going to accomplish. So we say, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Um, the Bible tells us that God's will on earth will come to pass. You know, we, we see that in the book of Revelation. We've seen the end of the book. Uh, God wins and um, Jesus takes possession of the earth. That's going to happen with or without us. The Lord in his sovereignty will make sure that happens. Um, but Jesus taught that God has ordered the world in a way that we get to partner with him and our prayers contribute towards his will coming to pass. And so I want to be part of that. And I hope that you want to be part of that because it's a it's a royal invitation. It's a holy invitation uh, that we get to partner with the creator of heaven and earth to see justice, to see love fill the earth, to see his glory shine forth. So what do you need to do? What do you need in order to be able to do that more effectively? Well, you need to get to know God's will so you can pray according to God's will. Uh, some people um, don't have because they don't ask. Some people don't have because they ask for wrong things. Some people ask with wrong motives. So as we, as we um, delve into the scriptures, we want to understand what is God's will for himself? What is God's will for the earth? What does God will us to pray for? How does he will us to pray? And God's word reveals that. And, and, and this is a bit of a cycle because if you're reading the word and you're not picking that up, the Bible calls you to pray for revelation that you might understand God's will. So we pray for revelation to understand God's will. And as we do, God gives us more revelation. And then we pray in line with that revelation. And Jesus says to the one who has more will be given to the one who has not even what he has, it'll be taken from him. OK, so we, we posit positively enter into this cycle of understanding and of revelation by praying and asking for it. Uh, and then by reading the scriptures and as he gives it to us, we then go back to him in prayer and with more understanding, we continue to ask him to accomplish what he's already purposed to accomplish. And in that way, he gets glory. The next thing is that we pray with regularity and we pray with persistence in prayer. The Lord's Prayer, the next line says, give us this day our daily bread. Jesus' expectation is that to be full of God. Okay, and we're called to be filled with the fullness of God in the book of Ephesians. Um, to, be, to be filled with the fullness of God, which is to be filled with his word, which is to be filled with daily bread, you need to pray daily. Okay, I can't pray today for tomorrow's bread. I need to come before the Lord every day, throughout my day, continually saying, Lord, feed me. You know, if I'm, if I'm going to have a meal, a physical meal, I don't just stuff my face with a huge meal and expect that to last me the next week or even the next two days or even the next day. Okay, that would give me indigestion. It would be too much for me to take and my body couldn't cope with it. It's better we, we know now nutritionists would tell you to eat little and often. And prayer, I believe, is like that. We come to God little and often throughout our day. It doesn't need to be a big, heavy burden, okay, that we've got to go and pray five hours at once, okay, from the start. But we get used to coming to God and being fed as we go through our day. We get used to relying on him every day. The next thing we see in the Lord's Prayer is that Prayer needs to include the confession of sin before God. Uh, forgive us our debts, we're taught to pray. You know, Jesus has made a way for you to be forgiven of all that's happened in your past. He's made a way for you to be forgiven of what you've done today that might be displeasing to God. And his cross has accomplished forgiveness for you in the future as well, if you make mistakes. Uh, but we can't just look at that truth and sit back and not do anything about it. 
conscious sin has to be confessed before God. It has to be confessed daily. It has to be confessed even throughout our day. The best thing, if you know you've done wrong before God, is to keep a short account and confess it straight away. Uh, we see what happens if you don't in the life of David. In Psalm 32, David said this. He said, when I kept silent about his sin, he said, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand, God's hand, was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. You know, when you speak to the Lord about your sin, the weight of sin lifts. You might not even know you've got a weight there. Trust me, if you've got unconfessed sin, there's a weight. And when you confess it, the weight gets lifted. Many people abound because they refuse to accept responsibility for sin uh, and or they refuse to open their mouth about it to the Lord. They may just sin and think in their hearts, Lord, I'm sorry, I'm sure you'll forgive me. The Lord says, no, I want you to come and open your mouth before me. I want you to talk to me about it. There needs to be communication in the relationship. And if there is, it lifts the weight. And you know, sometimes that weight is a spiritual weight, but as we see in the life of David, his bones were wasting away. His, you know, he, he he felt the hand of God heavy upon him. His strength was sapped. Okay, he was weak. He probably didn't even want to get out of bed. Okay, that's how he was like because he had unconfessed sin in his life. It can affect you physically. It can affect you mentally. Okay, so you need to follow Jesus' example if you're one of his followers. Okay, and you need to confess your sin. If you're not one of his followers and you're watching this, you need to get right with God and you need to come and ask God to have mercy upon you through the sacrifice of Jesus and you need to begin confessing sin and you'll start to experience the life of God. You know, God already knows any sin that's in your life. It's not a surprise to him. There's nothing you can hide from him. But if you try to hide from him, it's not good for you. You need to come and confess it before him. Here's the fifth thing. We need to have a resolve to forgive the sins of others that they've committed against us. Because if we don't, that's going to hinder our prayer life. And that's why Jesus taught us to pray, not only forgive us our debts, but also as we have also forgiven our debtors. The Bible is very clear. If after uh, receiving an understanding of the cross and the forgiveness that Jesus has bought for you at the cross, if you then withhold forgiveness from others, God will choose to withhold his forgiveness from you. The measure that you deal out to others will be the measure that's dealt out to you. So, you know, if you know that you're harboring bitterness or anger or unforgiveness, you're holding on to things that happened weeks, months, years ago that somebody did and it's still eating away at you. If you don't come and deal with it before God, and release them and forgive them, your prayers are going to be hindered. Your spiritual life is going to be affected. You're not hurting them, you're hurting yourself. Um, you'll most probably do what Adam and Eve did. You'll hide from God. That's what they did when they sinned and they felt shame. That's what we do. We hide away from God. We draw away from him. So he draws away from us. He says, if you draw close to me, I'll draw near to you. But when we sin and we don't confess it, we, we pull away. Maybe not all the way away immediately but we gradually pull away from him and that's how people end up i suppose the, the the term for it is backsliding and falling away from god and ultimately committing apostasy in the end okay because they don't deal with things before god and they slowly slowly drift um and if you've got that thing in your heart it might be that you you, you hide if you do come and pray you'll not be praying with a clean conscience you'll be praying with a divided mind and if we're double-minded and we know there's guilt because we've not released people and we've not forgiven people, uh, we won't come before God with assurance and with faith. And of course, that affects our prayers as well, because James says the double-minded man receives nothing. So we need to come with a single mind. We need to come with a clean conscience. And so when you forgive others, it releases you. Okay, so do yourself a favor. If you are holding on to anything, forgive people. Okay, because you'll be released and then God can release you and you can have a fruitful prayer life. And the last thing we need, and this is really important, 
is we need an honest admission of our weaknesses and, and a recognition of the need of God's Spirit in our lives. Uh, the, uh, what we see at the end there is Jesus teaches us to pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. What we see there is we can't be delivered from temptation without God's help. Uh, Jesus said in, in John 15, he said, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, says Jesus, and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. This is the key. Jesus then says, from apart from me, you can do nothing. He doesn't say apart from me, you can do a little bit. He doesn't say apart from me, you can do your best, but not the best. He says apart from me, you can do nothing. You know, prayer, if nothing else, is an honest admission that we cannot love God the way we should without God's help. Again, it's an acknowledgement of our weakness. It's an acknowledgement of our childlike reliance on him. That's why living this lifestyle of communion with God through worship, prayer and fasting as a lifestyle is one of our callings. Without it, we cannot be disciples who love God. And certainly we cannot be disciples who make disciples who love God. So, you know, a Christian who doesn't live a lifestyle of prayer is a Christian who is either prideful, believing that they can love God in their own strength, um, ignorant, not knowing that they can't love God in their own strength, or is lukewarm, apathetic to whether they love God well or not. And none of those are heart attitudes that will end well, and none of those are heart attitudes that we as a church want to embrace. We don't want that for anybody. We want the best for everybody in our community. So let's give ourselves to think about Jesus' life, ponder on what I said about how he lived and how he ministered and how he relied on his Father for everything through every aspect of his life. And let's be people who follow Paul's encouragement that he lays out for us in 1 Thessalonians 5.17 when he calls us to pray without ceasing. It's not possible to live a faithful Christian life without following that command, to pray without ceasing. And we need God's help even to do that. So uh, let's pray today and ask God to come and help us. Let's draw near to him and let's rely on him for everything. Would you join me as I pray? Father in heaven, thank you for the example of Jesus, who is your only begotten son, who is the God-man, the Son of God, who became flesh, the Word of God who became flesh and dwelt among us. And we've seen his glory. We've seen his righteousness. We've seen his power. We've seen his obedience to you. We've seen him live a life without sin. Um, but all of that undergirded by a lifestyle of reliance on you, Father. He said he only, he only does what he sees you doing. And he, he laid out how reliant he was on you through what he said, but also through how he lived. Lord, in, in the gospel, we recognise that we're saying that we can't find our own way to you. We can't be right with you. And we're saying we can't live a life apart from you providing the means for us to do it. So thank you that in Christ we're made right with you. Thank you that in Christ... We have a new identity. But as we think today about prayer, we thank you that in Christ we can approach you and we can seek all that we need to help us live a godly lifestyle, to help us love you with all of our heart, soul, mind and strength, to help us love others, to help us put to death the, the deeds of the flesh, and to help us make disciples and walk out the Great Commission. Uh, Lord, we thank you today that we get to partner with you in your plan for the earth. Uh, thank you, Lord, for that high privilege that you call us to be a royal priesthood. 
you call us to stand as priests. We remember today that a priest is not a church leader or a priest is someone who stands before you, ministers to you and speaks to you on behalf of the people. And Lord, would we all live as priests? Would we be a priesthood within our church? Would the body of Christ walk in this truth? And Lord, in all of these things, would you help us? Give us understanding, give us revelation, give us insight, give us strength. Give us your spirit that we might live a life laid down for you. We pray that your church would be a house of prayer, as you've called it to be, a house of prayer for all nations. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Enjoy the rest of your week.